What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources, the Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment I saw these young African-Americans doing was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up. And to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the Cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes. And I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell a story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 11th annual Black Comic Book Festival. I always like to do a room check before uh, we start. So I want to see show of hands. How many of you, is this your, like, returning? Are you returning to the event? How many of you have been to the festival before? Raise your hand. Wow, OK. Oh, oh, OK. All right, all right, let's see. Now, how many of you, is this your first time attending the festival? Wow. So just give it up for yourselves, please. Thank you so, so much for joining us. My name is Katie Atu Tubman. I'm the manager of education programs here at the Schomburg Center and the executive producer of the Black Comic Book Festival. Uh, and it is my privilege and honor to welcome you to the Schomburg Center. Over the course of nearly 100 years, the Schomburg Center's librarians, curators, educators, and other professional staff have worked tirelessly to provide robust and free, because this is free, public access to more than 11 million items that document black life and promote the study of history and culture of people of African descent. History is not only housed here, it is made here. This festival is historic. In our 11th year, we're proud to bring about 45 exhibitors, independent and you know, mainstream, to join us to showcase their work, to network with you all, and inspire you and show you what the true meaning of representation is. Programs like the one you're attending today exist because of our commitment as an institution to imagination, creativity, community, and representation. Today's program, though, the panel you're here for, y'all know what y'all here for? Yeah. <laughs> right? Speaking for ourselves, black women and marginalized voices in comics, right? And so as a black woman who is running this event, and I know so many amazing black women creators, educators who have worked tirelessly to put this event on, it's important that we speak light and we show and shine a light on these this women who are often marginalized, who are often like, you know, kept out of spaces. And we're always trying at the Schomburg Center to promote a space for them and make space for them because they absolutely deserve it. But before we get started with our panel, I do want to take a moment to honor someone in our comic book community who has recently passed away. Our, a good friend of mine, one of my biggest cheerleaders, uh, Maya Crown Williams, the founder of the Midwest Ethnic Convention for Comics, um, recently passed away this year. She was a huge, yeah, give it up for please. She was a huge pillar of our community, a, an inspiration, a beautiful and complicated person, um, but she would always tell you how it is. That's what, when you, if you know a black woman in your life, we'll tell you how it is. She is that kind of person. And so before we get started with our panel, I've invited someone who was near and dear to her heart, Greg Anderson Elise, to just say a few words about her and her legacy, and then we'll start with the program. Good afternoon, how you guys doing? You guys having a good time? Yeah. So um, I was actually quite honored to even hear that they were doing a tribute for my, I was calling my sister, honestly. And uh, I knew in the back of my head, I can hear her saying, if you, ain't, if you ain't doing it, tell them no. You better, you better get your ass, your black ass up here and do this for me. Um, people who are laughing know that's literally how she spoke. You know, she, um, she was a force, a huge force, whether you loved her or not. Um, almost everyone has gotten cussed out by her. I've gotten cussed out by her. Um, but the thing is, regardless of how annoying you would find the stuff she would say, there was always some weird truthness to it or something that would come back around and you just hear her say, see, I told you, I told you. But um, she, as I said, she was a force. Uh, she was a huge, huge advocate for just blackness. And uh, one of the things that inspired her into getting into the world of comic books was her son is a huge geek, nerd, loves manga, but she wasn't seeing any books with black people in his stuff. And so she did a couple of uh, research. She started uh, meeting a lot of artists. She started looking up comic books and found the huge range of black comic book creators out there, but they just were not getting the right recognition. So she created MechaCon, which was a, uh, a uh, comic convention similar to this in Detroit. And 
she, as I said, she was a huge advocate for blackness, for black comics, for black art. She would help a lot of black artists get a lot of jobs and residencies and gigs. And when I say she was a huge advocate, like, bar none, she was one of the top. And she would always say, you know I'm blackity black, right? I'm blackity black. Everything got to be black. You know, if you come into my show, you got to be blackity black. And that was all she stood for, really. And um, I miss her tremendously. And I don't want to cry in front of y'all, but I'm very glad that you guys are here to not only see this tribute, but also be here at part of this panel because as much as she was blackity black, she was also a huge advocate of supporting black women, making sure black women um, were not being taken advantage of. Because as we know, women are very marginalized. No matter what type of field it is, especially in the art field, there's the whole aspect of being seen as lesser than and uh, being taken advantage of and so on and so forth. And to put on top of that, women, but then there's also now black women. That's like two strikes against you right there. And she made sure that she would try to make some bonds, whether they lasted or not, but she was there to try to get, to make sure everyone got what uh, they were worth. So uh, without any further ado, I won't keep talking. That way you guys have your awesome panel. Um, this is the tribute to Maya Crown Williams. Thank you. All right. Now I'm ready for this super, super amazing panel. Um, so let's just jump right into it. But so before we get to the panel, just quick housekeeping. We're going to provide some microphones for you all for Q&A. There'll be opportunity for you to walk up to a microphone and, talk, and just ask your question at, uh, towards the end of the program. All right, so right now I'm going to invite to the stage, please welcome our moderators, Erica Hardison and Keisha Parks from Nerd, Herbs, and Words. And our amazing esteemed panelists, we have Shauna Grant, Kara Mahorn, Elizabeth Columba, and Barbara Brandon Croft. Please enjoy the program. One, two. All right, everybody can hear me? <laughs> Ooh, this light is bright. Yeah, it's very bright. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody to Speaking for Ourselves, Black Women and Marginalized Voices in Comics. My name is Keisha. I am a co-host for a podcast called Nerds, Herbs, Nerds, Herbs and Words. We are a 420-friendly literary podcast where we talk about comics, pop culture, books, all of that. Um, I'm a native of New York, but I live in the middle of nowhere in Massachusetts right now. <laughs> um, this is our lovely panel. We have Shauna. Uh, Shauna with a... <laughs> right? Let's get some applause. <laughs> uh, with a love of all things pink and magical, Shauna J. Grant is a cartoonist who creates cuteness. She is the creator of early reader graphic novels, Mimi and the Cutie Catastrophe, Right? <laughs> Mimi and the Boohoo Blahs, published by Scholastics, as well as the artists of First Seconds graphic novel, History Comics, Rosa Parks, and Claudette Col Colvin. Shauna uses her cute anime-influenced art to craft stories about self-love, empathy, strives to show black girls as the heroines of their own magical adventures. Native to the Bronx, Shauna now resides in upstate New York with, a, with her dog, Su Sugar Paws. Uh, Karama Horn, you don't know, I'm like a huge fan of everyone here, but I've been following Karama forever. <laughs> Karama is a journal, culture journalist, podcaster, and content creator, host and critic parked at the intersection of Greekdom and diversity. A former commercial video editor, she is the founder of TheBlurredGirl.com, a site dedicated to black nerd geekdom and pop culture. As a journalist, Karama has bylines at Rotten Tomatoes, Nerdist, Mashables, Sci-Fi Wire, and The Rap. As a host, she has been featured as a guest host on Red Carpets, Comic-Con Stages, and is the host of The Pop Paranormal, a horror podcast on Travel Channel. Karama has been featured in New York Times, USA Today, The Guardian, and more. And in 2022, her first novel, Black Panther, Protectors of Wakanda, a history and training manual for the Dora Milaje, was released. 
Yes, we're gonna give it up for that. Thank you. <laughs> and she makes her debut as a comic book writer in Marvel's Voices, Wakanda Forever. So, yes. You read the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> I thought she was gonna edit it down. Thank All you. right, we're gonna edit the rest <laughs> down. Okay, next is Elizabeth Columba. She's a fine arts artist born in France and raised in, I'm not gonna attempt to say it, can you tell me? <laughs> Um, she lives and works in New York City. Uh, she received a degree in applied art from SDN School of Art in Paris. And let me tell you, her art is absolutely fantastic. If you ever look at it online, it is magical. Um, it has historical, fan, um, historical fiction, kind of. I will explain it later. <laughs> but it is absolutely beautiful. Um, and then we have, she also, sorry. She also did the artwork for Queenie, which is done through Megascope Comics, if you guys ever get a chance to look at it. <laughs> and then we have Barbara Brandon Croft, who was the first syndicated cartoonist, black syndicated cartoonist, in mainstream. Right, we gotta remember that, in mainstream. <laughs> yes. If you guys ever look at it, it's called Where I'm From. It is an amazing comic strip, all right? So I don't keep stumbling over myself. We're just gonna get to this conversation. <laughs> so we're gonna start with Karama, since you're like the newest out of everyone in this. Um, how was it going from journalist to now writer of Marvel to comic book writer? Uh, terrifying. Um, the, and it all came about in a very, very strange way, but I, I, as many people know, I'm used to doing what you do and talking about the people that are up here, and it was, it's been strange being on the other side of it, um, but now I understand so much more what so many writers and artists go through um, in their process. I am very clear about the fact that writing a book about a Black Panther character that came out the same a, a month or two before a Black Panther movie is not what n normal people get to do. I, I'm clear on that. Um, but even writing the comic and things like that, the, I think the working with licensed characters has inspired me to now start working on my own. I have my own original characters in my head, but that I think I'm, I now, having been able to do this, I'm going to be creating some of my own characters too. So. Yeah, thank you. Yes. That was gonna be my next question. Like, do you think as an artist, as a writer, as a creative, is it better to, you know, work on your own versus, you know, working with already established characters? Um, I will say it does not hurt having Marvel on your resume. <laughs> but I'm very also very clear on the fact that um, I wrote a, you know, a YA novel about these incredible fictional characters, um, the Dora Milaje, and the portion uh, that I wrote in the comic was about T'Challa. Um, but I'm also bound by the fact that I'm an African-American woman writing about fictional African characters that were created by white people. I'm very clear on that. So there's certain things that you just can't change. Like I can't give them a last name. Like nobody in Wakanda has a last name. And it makes me crazy. But that's not something that you can change because every, everyone from the continent I know has seven names. So, but like these are things you can't change. But then Thor Odinson, we know his entire family line. And you know, and every one of those characters have last names and third names, and one of the nephews was a horse with six legs. Like, come on. So <laughs> I'm not making that up. That actually happened. Um, so I think there is a certain amount of joy that comes from playing with these licensed characters because it's familiar, and you know you can kind of start in the middle of the story because fans will know where you're coming from. But at the same time, you're also there's always a fence. You can only go so far with a certain character as opposed to if this was my own, I could really, you know, jump those boundaries. And what about everyone else? Like, well, I guess this is a question for everyone. Was it easy, hard getting into publishing, being established in this industry? 
I guess we'll start with Shauna. Um, yeah, so I started out just going to conventions and doing a web comic, and now I'm being published by um, Scholastic, First Second. I do work for IDW. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's um, it's very interesting. Like it's always been my dream to do what I'm doing, but like actually doing it, it's like oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's definitely different, like having to work with like a whole team on your story. Um, I feel like my path to getting published isn't like, I don't know, like usual, but at the same time with comics, like there is no standard. There's so many ways to do it and so many ways to bring into the industry. So um, with getting uh, my first book deals, I actually just met editors like at this very con. So I like to thank Karama because you got me into this convention. <laughs> and, like, I really, forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was like seven, eight years ago. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> and, yeah, I was like, there needs to be more, more women here. <laughs> and if anybody knows me, I don't ask. I just kind of roll deep. Yeah, like, she's yeah. coming with she's me. She's like, you yeah. have to email these people. And yeah, like, and you're getting oh, a table. Okay. And then you're going to bring another woman because that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it started like that. And then um, I found my agent at another um, anime convention. And I just, just keep stumbling into things, but that's my path. And so um, when I was working on Mimi, which is my first um, original series, because I also did um, a history comic, which was written by Tracy Baptist, who some may know, who's a New York Times bestselling author. And um, I didn't really have control over that story. I just had to like illustrate it and like just translate her words into visuals, which was very um, interesting experience, like never having worked with a writer before, but um, Scholastic actually like worked with me from the ground up to pitch my Mimi series because they were like, we love you and we don't want acquisitions to be able to say no to you. So um, before that, like my other pitches was just like, I guess this is okay. This is what my friends say they were looking for, but um, having to like you want to please yourself but you also like want to please like your editors your creative director and like one of them was like i want this to feel like little lulu and i'm like i know what that is so i got you i guess so i guess so um so and then like the final product um you have like designers who put the books together and um, I'm really grateful because one of them um, is a friend of mine. And so it's like, oh, you're like working on making my books beautiful. So I'll like I'll hand her like a cover um, illustration and then she'll send something back. And I'm just like, oh, like, why didn't I think of that? The color, what did you do? It's so beautiful. So I just, I, I love the experience. Like, making it by yourself like self-publishing it can get lonely um but like again it's, that's why community is so important because you want to like show your work to others and get feedback because you really need that feedback whether it's from friends and peers or like the editors and your publishers that you're working for because comics is a it's a collaboration and like even reading comics is a collaboration because there's so many ways that you can interpret like how to read the page and how you take in the visuals and the experience. So doing that with your art and writing and everything. And um, yeah, so it's just, it's very different from working on a webcomic by yourself. <laughs> Elizabeth, like I know your entry to comics was very different. Like you went from fine arts to now graphic novels. So. Yeah, very different. Well. Um, I just decided to treat it like a medium, the same as you would think of oil painting or watercolor. And part of my practice as a painter is to find out about black characters that feel I've been overlooked by history. And then I focus and do a, a portrait that gives homage to their legacy and their history. And then I found out about this extraordinary woman called Stephanie Sinclair, also known as Queenie, hence the title of the book. Um, and she, and I felt like there was similarities that I could not ignore uh, in the sense that she is from Martinique and my parents are from Martinique and she moved to Harlem and I live in Harlem. 
And um, my mother told me about her, and I wanted at first to do a portrait, an old painting of her. And the more I found out about her, hello. <laughs> and the more I found out about her, I, I wanted to be able to tell maybe a fuller story or find a way to you know, put details in front of us. Um, and I went to a show of Kerry James Marshall in 2016, um, and he had a room dedicated to his graphic novel called The Rhythm Master that he did uh, publish in the 90s in, in the newspaper. And then I thought I was, it gave me the idea to treat this as an art form and to use it to tell the story of Stephanie Sinclair. So at first, um, I kind of wanted to self-publish myself and get a blog and do uh, a one page a week or something like that. So I started for the first five pages. Not first, it was basically a moment in the story where she's trying to flee to uh, the south, down south, and she, the bus gets stopped by the KKK. So I thought that was a very gripping moment. Um, and my friend in France, um, she is a novelist, and she decided to introduce me to her publisher in France. And I was like, oh, you know, I want to publish in the States. She's like, well, try it. So I sent the, the, the pages to um, the publisher, and he loved it. And within the week, he signed, we signed a contract, and he said, I will guarantee you it will be published in the US, because we have ties and we can publish it internationally. So I said, OK, I'll roll with that. So um, that's how I started. Uh, and then the friend who introduced me, she's a writer, so I decided to co-write the story with her. And once we got a script, I started doing the drawing, and it was during the pandemic, so it was perfect because I couldn't paint. So I started to do the graphic novel. Yes. And it's, yes. <laughs> and it's through a Megascope, correct? Uh, it's through, yeah, actually. Yes. Right? If <laughs> anybody, if you don't know about Megascope Comics, it is absolutely phenomenal. It's been really hard for me to find something from that imprint that I don't like. <laughs> like, it is phenomenal. Yeah, it was, and, and may I say it's John Jennings, who is an editor at Megascope. Oh, all right. <laughs> who really pushed for this to be, to be accepted by, by Megascope, so. Yes. And then Barbara, what about you? <laughs> Hi. So, um, um, so I, I have a book out now. Um, I'm different. I'm like um, uh, an oddball here on this panel because I'm a newspaper cartoonist, or had been. Um, I made a, my distinction. I mean, there have been. There's uh, Jackie Orms. We must know. Yes. Who yes. was the first black woman to have a, a newspaper cartoon? It was in the black press. Um, what I did was I crossed the color line, so I was in the mainstream pre pre press. I say mainstream, it's a euphemism, in the white press. And um, so um, I came up with a comic strip, and um, I sent it to, there's a story behind it, but I sent it to Detroit Free Press, a white paper, yay! And, um, and they liked it, and they took it, and I was published. Um, my dad is a cartoon, was a cartoonist, and he was one of the pioneer black cartoonists. I'm like this, um, um, I have a, a sense of history just by circumstance. I was born into it. And um, so I know a lot about um, black comics in newspapers because I lived it. I watched my dad live it. And we have a certain um, affinity for history. So I've done my research. But we're talking about books. So um, when, after I got my first, um, when, I, when I got to, into Detroit Free Press, I um, put together a collection of all the strips I did that first year. And I took it to, now this is 89, so um, I took it to, it wasn't Kinko's yet, but you know, some kind of printer place and made books um, that cost me $4 to make. I sold them myself for 10 bucks. And um, yes, right. yes. <laughs> I would sell a hundred, and you know, with the profit, I'd buy more. Um, and when I finally got a syndicate, I told them, um, "You need to do a book deal with me, because I sold 700 books by myself." And so I think you need to do that. They're like, "Oh, we never do that." I think you need to do that, and they did do it. So I got two collections um, with Anderson McNeil. 
Um, and then my syndication ended in 2005. And so it's been, you know, some time that I have not been doing the strip, um, except I started working again because I couldn't help myself when uh, 45 came down that elevator, uh, escalator. And it was in me. So now I do, I do it. I don't get paid. I just do it because I can't help myself. Um, but I got a call from Drawn and Quarterly, which is a, you know, a phenomenal publisher in Canada. And they're like, we like your stuff. We need to put it together a book because you're, it's a history that needs to be told and needs to be solidified and people need to be able to find it. And I said, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I could do that. Um, so they said, you need an agent. I got an agent. I got a book. And um, that's how my happened. So it was, it's very different than, um, I, I didn't have to write a new book, although there's, there's a lot of um, additional information. Um, I, I'm not gonna sound like I know something, but it's like an origin story of, of where I'm coming from. So it tells how it came to be, and it's uh, um, a professor wrote um, um, uh, an essay in there, putting it in historical context, and um, there's, there's a lot of stuff other than just the, um, the 14 years I was syndicated, but that's my book story. I just, I just need to comment on something because Barbara, you said you're an oddball up here. You're not an oddball at all. <laughs> okay. And we probably wouldn't be sitting here if you hadn't done what you did. Oh. So oh, okay. I, yeah, I can't yeah. let you say that you're Thank an oddball you. because <laughs> right. you're the reason why so many people, so many women yeah. have been able to Thank be you. cartoonists and comic yeah. book creators. Absolutely. Don't downplay yourself okay. because a lot of us didn't have comic book stores in our neighborhoods. But you know what we did have? We had Papers, newspapers, newspapers every day. Newspapers, And yes. we read those comics. That was a lot of our introductions to comics. And what would the boondocks be yeah. without the comic book? I mean, the comic strips and the newspaper. That's so right. you absolutely are in good company. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I guess that goes into the next question. Um, what was your first comic book? This is for everybody. The first comic book, comic strip that you read and fell in love and it was like, this is my thing from here on out. So I'm gonna start with, who wants to go first? <laughs> I think mine was, the, it, this had an impact on me because I have two young, I'm the oldest, I'm the only girl, I have two younger brothers. So yeah, they were into comics, but ew, because siblings. Um, and so, uh, so I, they had comics, but I didn't necessarily read them. But the one that had an impact on me was Spider-Man Annual number 16, because Monica Rambeau was on the cover, but it was from the back. And all I saw was, it's Spider-Man, but that's a woman with an afro. What is happening? And I remember somebody at school had it. I don't remember, and I can't even remember, it had been out already. They just had it and I remember trying to borrow it and then seeing her basically kick ass in a pantsuit and I'm like whatever is happening I want more of this <laughs> but I was I was like you were saying like we didn't where I grew up they didn't have I'm not saying there weren't comic book shops but my mother's from the island she's like we are not going to spend money on it no no go study no <laughs> so <laughs> so my introduction to actual comic book characters and lore and sequence was really TV, like animated series and then uh, anime and things like that. But the comic book that I saw, and that's why I have an affinity, I'm really excited about Marvels, because it's the first time I'm gonna see Monica Rambeau on the screen. Yes. Um, so I'm excited about that. So I have a question. Do you own that issue? I do. I own, I don't own the issue that I, I couldn't get it prior from the hands of the person that had it. <laughs> but I did go off and get, um, uh, actually, a, it's not pristine. I actually need to, it, you're just reminding me, I actually need to get it graded. Um, but I, it, it's box and boarded and has not been opened since I got it. So yes, I do own that one. <laughs> All right. How about you, Shauna? Um, yeah, I, I'm just realizing, like, yeah, I didn't have a comic book store when I was growing up. Um, but I had the corner store, so, um, I used to read, like, the Sonic comics. Um, yes, I was Sonic. never, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't really into, um, like, 
Marvel and DC comics, I love the TV shows, but the comic books just didn't do it for me. But what did it for me was hanging out at the library and reading manga, because this was like the early 2000s when it was first coming out, and you had like an America magazine. That magazine was like the first time I saw so many like cutesy, feminine, female characters, like in a comic book form, like Revolutionary Utena. And then of course, like seeing Sailor Moon on TV and getting to read the collected com graphic novels at the library and, and Peach Girl, like those books were like, wow, like I do like comics. Like there's stories that are about girls like me and school and you know, friendship drama or like saving the world and um one other book that really really like had a weird effect on me that has nothing to do with shoujo um was this book called uh something something weed and it was it's 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 weed like the pl like the little from like dandelions it was about mm -hmm. a dog okay it's about dogs. It was basically like Dragon Ball Z, but with dogs. And there were these dogs in Tokyo that were gathering up together to make this big army to go like fight bears and find this puppy's dad. And I was just like, what? This is dogs. And they're like freaking like Batman, Superman adventures going on. And I was like, if you can make a story about dogs being like crazy action heroes, then why can't I make stories about whatever I want to make, you know? <laughs> Um, Barbara? Um, so, um, because I'm a, of a different generation, we also, I didn't, I wasn't really into comic books, but I had a cartoonist in my home, my dad, and we lived in a small house, and when he, um, he always did comic strips, um, he did um, editorial cartoons, uh, political cartoons, and when he got syndicated with his comic strip, Luther, um, he set up um, a studio in the in the in the dining room. So um, we he'd do his work, um, and then he'd clear it off, and we'd have dinner there. You know, so comics were I was like immersed in comics. I I didn't even realize how what an impact it was making on me. Um, and and as far as comic books went, I was into like uh, Richie Rich and you know Archie. And, you know, it's a little embarrassing, but that's the kind of comics that. That I used to a lot of no, people's no, interest. No, no, Archie, 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 Archie comments and, on webtoons. Okay. And also, Archie. Archie's got a huge TV yeah. show, Riverdale, like, yeah. come on. And, and you know what? Archie was the most accessible because they used to sell them in the grocery store. That's how I come got I got them. That's how yeah. I got mine. <laughs> but uh, I was really a huge Mad Magazine fan. Um, that was my thing, yeah. Um, and, you know, when Mad Magazine contacted me once I was syndicated and they said, this is how I knew I felt like I made it. They were like, we would like to put your strip in Mad Magazine. I was like, what? And it's, it's like, oh, yes, you may, you know. So, but that, awesome. that made me feel like I had come, I had arrived, you know. Um, I was like, wow. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I was just gonna mention that, you know, we, we depended on newspapers to see it and the importance of newspapers and seeing comics in newspapers. Um, when I was growing up, there was a strip called Friday Foster Mm -hmm. which was a woman, you know, and um, an action thing. But guess what? It wasn't drawn by a woman. It wasn't written by a woman. And uh, neither one of them were black. So I'm like, it, it's, it's just interesting that, you know, you get exposed to this stuff, but then when you know the backstory, you're like, huh. So it wasn't until um, I was able to do it. And, and, I, already, and I was like, you guys have done um, very few black cartoonists in syndication. I kind of put um, the syndicates on blast. I sent them a letter, you know, a press kit even, and said, you guys uh, haven't done, haven't put black car cartoonists in play since my dad's time, basically, since the 60s, and none of them have been women. I was like, I've been in Detroit for a year now. Somebody needs to, I can, it, it can sell. It's, it's, people are reading it and enjoying it. Um, and you know, I got rejected, but except for one, <laughs> except for one syndicate that uh, Universal Press was like, we like we like what you're doing, and uh, let's let's do it. So that's how that's how I came in, and I didn't even think I was going to be a cartoonist. Honestly, I saw it all my life. Um, I went to to uh, 
Oh, I was trying to get a job at, at El Elon Magazine. I don't know if you guys remember that, but that was a black woman's magazine that was kind of going to rival Essence back in the early 80s when nobody was alive yet, but, but back in the early 80s. But when, when um, I went there, um, the editor-in-chief was like, you know, you're kind of funny. You, you draw. Can you do a comic strip? That's when the light went on my head. You know, it's like, I can do that. I've seen it all my life. Um, so I kind of came into it on the back end, you know what I mean? I, I, I came into it differently. Again, my story. And Elizabeth? Elizabeth. <laughs> um, well, it's a bit different um, because the culture in Europe and certainly in France with comic books is really equated to the same as a novel. So um, you, it's integrated in, you know, as a kid very, very early. And I would definitely give a shout out to any libraries because I love the library. <laughs> and my first encounter to be able, because again, I come from a modest family. We didn't have a lot of money to buy books or anything. So library was my you know, safe space. And uh, yes, you can take books and you could take comic books and graphic novels and all that. So my first encounter, I would say with a comic book that I felt, well, maybe we can do better than this. So there's a very famous uh, illustrator called Hergé, who did the, all the Tintins, right? And one of the first one I, I, I got was Tintin in Congo, which is, yes, Ooh. yes. <laughs> and like the reaction I had <laughs> with my sister, my older sister, when we saw this, first of all, we were kind of excited to see black people in a, in a comic book. But then the representation of it was so caricatural and oh, the story was just despicable. I just thought, well, I think we could do better than this. So I think it was in a way, uh, it basically, I think, planted a seed for anything that I'm doing right now, which is either graphic novel or in my practice as a painter. It's just, we can do better than this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I feel like the questions are now just flowing. So like <laughs> representation, we, I know my experience with comics or I know anybody who has read a lot of comics, the representation, especially for people of color, for black people can, it can hurt. <laughs> um, do you think we've made any progress in the industry in terms of representation for black women, for marginalized peoples? Um, Anybody want to answer that first? Um, <laughs> yeah, I do think there is progress, um, especially like in animation. Like at the top of my head, I think of Craig of the Creek. <laughs> you know, and now we have Moon Girl. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's definitely a lot. Like, How much are you paying her? <laughs> <laughs> Can I get one, like, on Amazon? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, like, like, yeah, like, overall, like, there's, there's so, there's much, there this could be so much better, but, um, in the um, graphic novel industry here, there are a lot more diverse stories, and, um, and behind the scenes, too. I remember a few years ago, I was seeing more black-brown characters, but, not writers and, and, and artists, but now I'm like, so many um, black women that I know for so long are like, yeah, here is my book. And I'm just like, yes, just as great. So I think we're definitely going in a good direction. I think we are absolutely um, making progress, absolutely, but I definitely, there are definitely more black female characters and more representation in the characters than there are in the creators because black women basically kind of run most of the economic decisions and marketing. I mean, the algorithm on most social media doesn't know good attention, bad attention, it's all attention. So if you want to sell something, you either say something bad about a black woman or you say something good about a black woman and then black women are going to support and then you will magically get those numbers that you need to market that thing. So don't fall for the algorithm sometimes. Sometimes if it looks like bait, it is. You don't have to respond. Um, 
But I'm saying all that to say that there's, there's been a lot of black characters since 2018. Um, 2018 is when we got the first Black Panther movie, the first season of uh, Black Lightning, the second season of Luke Cage, and Spider-Man is the Spider-Verse. So 2018, all, that was a big year. And so since then, it's like, oh, black people buy things. It's like, yes, we do. So there's been a push to create a lot of black characters, make a lot of characters black that might not have originally been black because they want those dollars. I do think you can always tell when there's not always a black writer writing yeah. the characters. Yeah. Um, and so, and this is across everything, not just comics, but I'm, I'm just thinking of genre entertainment. So comics, gaming, anime, movies. Um, so I think we have to do a little bit better now with matching, like you got a black, because I can't tell you how many people, especially when I'm do, doing reviews and things, how many people like, oh, we have a black character. I'm like, right, how many black people are writing for you? If you stutter, I'm not covering that. You know, so it's just a thing where it's like, oh, we got a black person on the cover. Right, but what are you, your organization? Like, are you, and it's fine if you haven't up until this point, but who are you bringing in or who are you training? Do you have an internship program? You know, are there, are there efforts being made or are you just literally just trying to, you know, sell um, a book? So I think we have to work a little harder behind the scenes. And then also, I think just believe black women. It's just, I mean, like when, I, when I'm working, I can't tell you like daily how many times I have to answer the question, yes, I wrote that book. Like, no, who really wrote it? I'm like, no, I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you pitch it? I didn't pitch it. Marvel asked me to write the book. How? That's a flex. Like. <laughs> and yeah, when I, I'm not even saying it's a flex. I'm saying it like because I, I literally have made post after post, like, if y'all don't stop asking me if I wrote this book. And I've had people come up to me at conventions like, what are you going to do when Marvel finds out that you took their characters? I'm like... Because <laughs> Marvel doesn't let you just roll around and write about their stuff, by the way. For those of you who don't know, like, Marvel is very, very clear on what you can and cannot do with their characters. So, like, I'm just... And it's, it's really funny. And I've literally had people, dudes, sorry, that'll be like... <laughs> So, well, who really wrote this? And, you know, you're a ghostwriter, or did they ghostwrite it for you? And I'm like, no. How? Okay. And if I was going to, like, I'm not saying that Dora Milaje aren't something incredible to write, but wouldn't, wouldn't I want a character that everybody knew, maybe? You know? So it's just, it's, it's a little bit frustrating, I think, also, once you create the thing, that you have people like, okay, but can you do it again? Or are you sure, or there's no audience for this. And the, the last part of what I'm gonna say is, as much as we're seeing a lot of the great characters and when we do have writers behind the scene, they don't know how to market. There's no, they're still selling my, sending my book to like Kalamazoo, Michigan. Sorry for anybody in here who's Kalamazoo. But like they're still sending it to places that don't carry black books and then it gets returned and then you know the numbers go down. So it's really about also staying in front of your um, marketing and sometimes that's just social media. Sometimes and sometimes it's looking like all of the marketing for my book, yes it's a Marvel book, but all the mar marketing that I've done has been me. And I've been like reaching out to bookstores and reaching out to, and just, just like you said, like don't you think this should happen? And like we don't normally do that. Yeah, but today you're gonna do it. <laughs> You know, and not having the fear of, of doing that because when you start looking at some books that other people have written and seeing the numbers, the numbers that some people are being paid it for advances that have never written a book in their life and the marketing numbers, when you start seeing those numbers, that fear will go away. That, that um, I, you know, I, like most people, you know, suffer from a little imposter syndrome daily, um, but, but when you see some of those numbers, you go, oh no, I got this, I'm good. People who like, might have ghostwriters even, and they're getting tons and tons of money just to just show up. So I think, when I say believe black women, I mean believe us with your, your attention, your dollars, your support, if you can't afford to buy something, a, a retweet, a comment, or telling everybody, hey, this is a great thing I saw, please support. Um, even events like this, um, that's what is needed from our communities because our money 
leads mainstream <laughs> um, discussions uh, and, and, and mainstream, because all those doors that opened in 2018 and 2020, they're closed. I don't know if anybody told you, but diversity, diversity programming and diversity marketing is not really funded anymore. Um, so we really have to support ourselves. That's it, sorry. I was, I was just gonna talk a little bit about um, how black folks were seen historically. So when in the newspapers, when you had comic strips, um, they typically were not drawn by black people because they didn't hire black cartoonists. And it, when they did hire black cartoonists, they had to also go along with what was uh, commonplace. So from, we were seen, it was very, it was minstrel. That's how they saw black people. That's how we were portrayed. Um, we were, um, black women didn't look much different than black men. They just put on a dress, you know? And it was, we were seen as buffoons. We were seen as coons. We were seen as uh, all these uh, derogatory, like you were just talking about, all these derogatory characters. And um, it, even in, it took the NAACP in the 20s to um, boycott, uh, or, or uh, it's not, not exactly boycott, but take them to court, the, a paper in Chicago, to stop them doing blackface of the cartoon characters. It would just be totally black, you know, to lighten the characters so it actually looks like a skin tone. Um, so this is the kind of stuff, so, I mean, it makes you say, yes, we have come far, you know, we have come, you know, um, at, and, and by the 30s they said, you can't do Amos and Andy anymore, so that was taken out. But when the E.C. Sims was one of the first black cartoonists to have a, he was with King Features in the newspaper, mainstream newspaper, but his main character was a porter. So it's like, that's the only way you could see black characters in this kind of, just, you know, very similar to uh, Hollywood, how Hollywood saw black folks. So my dad's group of people, Wee Pals, Luther, Quincy, those are the three strips that came up in the 60s for the first time we had black hands drawing black characters being black people, you know, in the white press. Um, but there was the black press, and, the, and in the black press, there was Oliver Harrington, there was E.C. Campbell, who, who did strips in the black press that were actually really black people, you know, and Jackie Orms, I bring her up again, that's the first time you saw, you're like, oh, black people have curtains? You know, I mean, she did a whole environment, you know, she's like, it was, she had a home, you know, she had a, she was a reporter, you know, she had a, you know, um, it was the first time you could see that, but it didn't happen in the mainstream press until much later. Um, so that's just a little history lesson. <laughs> I feel like you, we definitely, yeah, moved a little bit forward. Um, I don't know if you remember a movie in around 2004, 2005, called Catwoman, yeah. featuring Halle Berry. Yeah. I was fortunate to do storyboards. I used to be a storyboarder for uh, Hollywood. I did storyboards for uh, that movie. And if you remember correctly, the marketing was all about, you know, this is the first time there's a black woman in a, uh, a superhero movie being um, mainstream. And it was an absolute disaster. <laughs> I mean, it flopped incredibly. And then for years, you didn't see any black actors represented again. Like, we can't fail. You know, once there's a black actor, it doesn't bring tons of money, it's gone. And it took... Um, basically by Black Panther to really show that black, black people can be also obviously super and bring money. So I feel like, yeah, in that sense, there is, you know, the needle move forward a little bit. And Wait, what year was that? The, the I think it was 2004. 2004. 2004. Or 2005. Okay. And so 2024, 20 years later, Monica Rambeau is about to be the first one since then 
crazy. On, 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 and yes, there have been Cat on Woman? TV. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, they've Can't been forget on TV. Eartha Kitt. Yes, definitely Kitt. on yes. TV. How old am I? I keep figuring yeah, yeah. up old stuff. Yeah, but yeah. Eartha Kitt. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. T- no, TV came first. Yeah. But like in terms of uh, uh, the big screen, big screen. So you're right. We can't fail. <laughs> okay, I guess my next question. Um, ooh, ooh, sorry, I thought you were going to ask a question. Okay. <laughs> well, before I ask a question, I want to say, you know, to your point about, you know, supporting community, I also want to say, you know, as a reviewer for Publisher Weekly, and I've published many book lists across many publications, mainstream and indie. Bullying works. It does. Okay, you have to bully these imprints, you have to bully these publishers, you have to bully the marketing team, you have to make them go viral with a bunch of things that you do not like. So other you know, publishers like Dateline and all those other mainstream variety can pick it up, they have bad press and they wanna rectify it. <laughs> That's basically how you have to get to see what you want to be seen. But I feel like um, we was at Comic-Con 2016, and I felt like at 2016 was the beginning of us as a collective, you know, black press, black journalists, black entertainment, black creatives, really about to like break through the door or at least try to like get the door open to come up with content because since 2016, we've kind of been like very adamant about black representation and entertainment. Um, and 2016 is when we broke broke Netflix when Luke Cage first yes, came out. So yes, that's I, I remember yes. that's when it started. They're like, oh, black people like superheroes. Like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, and I, I remember like the build up to Black Panther in 2018. I remember just excitement about it, and no one knew, not even Marvel. They had no idea, no marketing, no, no, no real Black Panther is the only reason no I merchandise to Marvel movies? <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, honestly, no, they didn't, because I was on the red carpet for the first movie, and when I tell you the mass confusion, and there was no, remember how there was no gear? There was mm-hmm. no sneakers, there was no, and, and they were licensing, Marvel was just giving their stuff to like jewelry people and things, they're like, they had nothing for the movie. Mm-hmm. And then this one, well, kind of forever, they had a lot, but it was just so funny because compared to the first one, there was nothing because no one was, yeah, this little movie, it might be okay. I want to ask everybody, what black girl or black marginalized projects are you excited for? Outside of your own, what are you looking for? I'm, and the reason why I'm I'm hesitating is because there's, um, like Ngozi Ukazu, mm-hmm. uh, um, she, well you I know you know her because uh, she very famously uh, had a comic book called Check This Check Please rather, and her comic which was very diverse but it was about a group of hockey players from down south, mm-hmm. basically broke the internet, broke Tumblr, broke everything, and she had DC and Marvel knocking at her door to create comics and she wouldn't, she was, because they were not paying her what she could make on her Kickstarters. Mm -hmm. And so she finally just started doing another series on her own. So, I mean, that's not even come out yet. So I'm excited to see what she has going on. So I'm I'm highlighting a creator more than like the the actual uh, work, but I'm very excited to see. For anyone that's interested, Check Please is a very cute, queer uh, graphic novel about hockey players falling in love. Yes. (laughs) It's really cute. Anybody else have any projects that they're looking at, that they're excited about? I'm going to take this moment to spotlight my bestie from high school, Yesenia Moises. She is a Afro-Latina children's book artist. And let me tell you, black Twitter is lit because they got her art out there and got her doing children's books. Because yeah, you put your art online, people will find you. Her latest book that just came out was written by Serena Williams. And she just sold two new original children's books. So I'm like really excited to see them come out. 
And yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm just endlessly proud of everybody that I'm surrounded by. And just, it's just I just love it. I love what's going on today. <laughs> I have a question for you since you brought that up. Mm-hmm. You know, middle grade books, especially graphic novels, are booming right now. Yes, if you yes they are. are. Let me tell you something. If you are an author and you want to get your book seen, I will suggest, highly suggest, go the middle grade route because you will probably get uh, a, a deal. <laughs> you will probably get multiple deals if the, if the book is good. But I want to ask you, how are you, do you think about book bans? Do you think about the possibility of your book being banned because Oh, I hope my book gets girl? banned. I mean, you all can answer Oh, it. I want, no, it's because the moment the book gets banned, it, everybody buys it. Exactly. it. What? Oh, yeah. It's the best marketing thing ever. <laughs> oh, I want my book to get banned so badly. I do. I would make, I would make so much money if my, bank, my book got banned. Because, no, because what's kept happening is every time somebody talks about banning a, uh, a black author's book, black folks go, oh, I'm buying it. In droves. I can't tell you how many people have bought books that have been like, yeah, I don't even know what it's about, but they said they banned it and I'm buying it. <laughs> I want my book to be banned so badly. That it won't be because it's Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> like, it won't be because it's Marvel, but I'm just saying. Um, yeah, I... <laughs> That, yeah, that made me feel a whole lot better. Um, so I don't have a lot in the middle grade area. I do have my Rosa Parks books, which I guess um, in the South, I guess it's not factually correct anymore. She, you know, Florida's crazy. But um, I do have my early readers books, and I really want to do more uh, middle grade, which I am, stuff I can't talk about. But um, yeah, there's so many more stories that I want to tell, especially stories that touch on LGBT issues within our community, because I don't feel like that is mainstream enough for us. And I know there are so many young queer kids of color that are just looking to see themselves in the books that they read. And I really want to make books like that as well. So yeah, the book bands are just like, are you serious? Like we were just climbing up this mountain and now you're just want to like just topple it down. Like what's going on? But yeah, I know, you know, the black community is always going to stand together regardless what they do down there. But <laughs> you know, I, the book bans definitely is a, like immediate reaction for book sales, but I feel like that's a short term resolution because the long term if your book is banned you know publishers become more resistant into looking for that type of content to publish so i love book bans i love book ban lists because i know like those authors are getting the money that they deserve for their books but in the long term i think about you know, upcoming authors and graphic novelists and illustrators who want to do the same type of content, but they're going to receive more of a cold shoulder because of the previous content. So my next question. Well, hold on, because <laughs> I got the sign saying we need to do the Q&A. Oh, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but okay. um, if anyone has any questions, um, where are the microphones for everybody? All right, they are stationed in the back. If anyone, <laughs> has any, if anyone has any questions, you can go to the microphone and ask away. They're in the corner. I see yes, them now. Yes, they are yes. standing. There's one right over here. We have somebody coming? Awesome. And while we're waiting, I just want to say that I am amazed by all of you. I'm so serious. Like, I was just telling Shauna, um, she's the reason why my seven-year-old is reading. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he was not a reader at all. But Mimi and the Cutie Catastrophe was the first time I saw him sat, sit down independently and like inhale a book. So like now I know I can buy him a bunch of comics. <laughs> so yes, whenever you're ready. Of course. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, I'm Clifford Smith, um, inspiring writer and um, illustrator. Um, I feel, I have a question that, do you believe as in the black community and as black authors and creators that it is important to create characters that 
are holy that they're their own and have their own, you know, struggles and uh, feelings within themselves, but happen to be black characters. Less of um, characters are made for like the black struggle or showing that, um, you know, growing up through uh, harder times, more so reality, but it feels more important that it embolds readers to um, have characters of their own personal struggles, but just happen to be black. Can I, can I just say something real quick? I, I, there is nothing wrong with being black and in, in, in during a struggle. And I, I, I think we need to kind of like decolonize why we are, or why some of us are uncomfortable with seeing other black people struggling. Like we don't have to present, you know, the best of ourselves, like the best, the black excellence, you know, cause that could be problematic too, because we fail sometimes, we hurt sometimes, we cry sometimes. Some of us are living in poverty, some of us are not. We have struggles and we should not have to adhere to respectability politics in literary works. So, I'm like, I, and just so I'm clear, I, uh, is is your question more about like, do we have to tell a story that is a slave narrative versus, like, you know, like that, or or uh, you know, a violent story? You know, is, is that your question? Yeah, like, do we have to be kind of? Well, it's important to tell those stories, but sometimes I feel that it's almost like we get pigeonholed into almost always kind of telling. But sometimes it's nice to have stories where you have characters that you can look at, and it's like, oh. I, I think a, the I think the deeper question is main what will mainstream sell versus right. what you because you can write whatever you want. Right. You can write your 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 imagination is limitless. Write whatever you want. If you're talking about what will sell, yeah, there is a lot of pain porn on the market. I'm I'm not I'm not gonna lie, it just is. But if but that doesn't mean that's the only story that you have to tell. So. If you, as a writer, don't think your character has gone through those struggles or needs to struggle or needs to have something violently horrible happen to them for their arc to continue, I don't, you, you don't have to do that. But, but in terms of making self-publishing and making your own story um, marketable, it's about finding a connection to the, 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 the people can connect to the character in some way as a reader. So it's finding that type of connection. It doesn't always have to be pain if that's, if I think that's what you're asking. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm just gonna jump in too, because I have, um, um, what I've done with my characters is, uh, I have like nine characters that are black women, distinct black women, and I think that um, the, it's not a graphic novel, It's it's, Snippets slice of life each time, but it's. Um, I think if you keep your characters true, I, I think if you keep them um, um, true and they show a certain humanity, and that certain humanity is going to cross the color lines because we are all indeed human, and all the struggles that we go through um, have to be dealt with however they're dealt with. So if I have my characters talk about things that happen in the black community, but I also have them talking about things that happen just across the board, you know? And because um, that's part of the education I think the country needs is to understand that we all are human and that there is a humanity that, that we're being denied when they see us as other. You know, it's like, we are not other. You guys, no, no, we're none of us, no, no, no. No, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. We are not, uh, just saying that we are, it's, there's a certain humanity <laughs> that has to be understood. Um, and whether we talk about what our struggle is, which we've had struggles, you know, or whether we talk about, whatever we talk about, if the, if the character is true and comes, you know, from the heart, I think it's gonna uh, resonate with folks. And whether it's marketable, we don't know. You know, we have to see how it goes, you know. Um, so, you know, don't take advice from me. I don't get paid <laughs> for doing my strip, but, but I need to do it, and um, I just put it out there. First of all, I would like to say uh, thank you, ladies, for coming here. And this is more of a, a thank you and a comment. Um, I remember a first here, uh, superhero movie I've seen, and you probably know, uh, and he's a, a famous actor, and he set the precedent that we have all these uh, 
mo uh, movies, and that's, I believe, Blade Wesley Snipes. And, right, yeah, and... Is this, he started the MCU. Right, and so... Fight we're, me. Yeah, Wesley Snipes' mother is black, so, you know, I would like to thank his mother and... Right. <laughs> This is real random, but doesn't Wesley Snipes have a comic out right now? Yeah. Right? Yes. See? I, I, didn't, I didn't hear the question. It, since His we're comic? talking about, since you brought up superheroes, I also want to shout out Robert Townsend. Yes. Because Meteor without Man. Meteor Man. Meteor Man. Without Meteor Man, I don't even think we would be having the conversations about black superheroes on TV. So I just want to shout him out because he's, I feel he's so, you know, he doesn't get all the flowers he deserves. No, he doesn't. I remember when they said Luke Cage was the first superhero. We were like, but no. No. <laughs> no. All right, are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> hi, my name is Jaden, and my question is, in the midst of your career, have you ever thought about giving up, and how did you keep on going? Um, Only on the days that end in Y. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, um, there, during my first graphic novel that I did for first second, um, the one about Rosa Parks and Claudette Cole, I actually got really depressed working on that. Like, I had to, like, stop for a few months. And again, it was, like, the imposter syndrome. Because um, it was so different from what I usually draw. It was just, like, happy, cute, pink stuff. I had to be, like, more realistic and down to earth. And it was my first time writing with a writer. It was my first time working for a big publisher. On top of it being, like, one of my dream publishers. And I just felt like... I didn't know like how to do it. Um, again, this is why I say like comics are a collaboration. Like, yeah, the writer wrote a script, but it's up to you to choose what to take from that script and actually illustrate. And so it was like a lesson for me to be able to like speak up about what I thought was, you know, like write what would be good and to be able to like trust that my editors and the writer would be fine with me being like I'm not going to draw all of the stuff that you're talking about because I think the focus needs to be here I think the page needs to breathe and you know so it just yeah that one broke me because I was just like oh my god this is my dream job and I hate it but I got through it and my writer absolutely loved what I did so it's like I did all that worrying for nothing <laughs> um, I went through something similar. Um, I only had 15 weeks to write my book, which I do not recommend. <laughs> Don't do that to yourself. Um, so I had to sort of sequester myself, shut everything down. I cried daily. Chuck knows I cried daily. He'd find me on the couch bawling, like, look at me. Um, I, what got me through is there's a, I think it was a TikTok or something I'd seen a, a while ago, uh, or it might have been on Twitter or something, but it was a little girl at Disney World in California at the Dora Milaje. They have like a, I guess it's like a show that happens on certain days. And she was standing there reciting the tenets and like was really, really excited. And I thought about it and I said, I'm writing the book for that little girl. And so the days that I'm like, I hate this, I hate everything, I hate my writing, um, I would go, but that little girl needs a book. Mm -hmm. And I promised that little girl I would make that book. And then at the end, I realized that that girl was me. Aww. So, but don't write, the way to get to do the next one is not to think of all of the pages you have to do, for me anyway, it was, I just have to write one more page. And then you just got to do that over and over again. Yeah. Hi. Oh, wow. OK. Um, I wanted to say thank you for coming out here. And thanks for the Schomburg Center to have this black comic book festival. And I wanted to ask the person on the right or your left, uh, Erica Hartson. Yes, uh, hi. Oh, okay. What was your question before you were cut off for the uh, I don't even remember. No, all right, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. No worries. Um, thank you for coming out. Thank you. Bye. Okay. All right, we have about five more minutes. So. All right. Hi, my name is Hi. Ashley. Um, so this is kind of an odd question. So full disclosure, I work at a bookstore. So 
sometimes when I do try and present books with different people of color, sometimes I might get a not so positive reaction. Um, could any of you kind of recall any story or any, or any anecdotes of when people came up to you, saw your work, and kind of gave one of those comments? Uh, just, just out of curiosity, when you suggest the books, are you suggesting them to uh, customers, or is this just to the customers. store? Customers. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Every every convention, there's somebody like, oh, and then, but I, I also have had the opposite. I was at uh, Forbidden Planet, and. Um, a young white girl came up to my table and was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And I'm like, is this bad, is this good, are you, are you okay? Like I was nervous. And then she went, ran to the back of the store, came back with her dad and was like, I have to have this. And I was like, wow. Because she was like a huge Black Panther fan and had, was trying to find stuff about the Dormelage. And so I w I, there have been crazy things that people have said like, oh, the book probably sucks. Or, oh. Like, why are you here? That's happened. But I, it, usually within hours, I have like something like the, what happened with the, the other young lady. Um, people are dumb. Like, don't, <laughs> don't be discouraged. Yeah, I mean, I, I also had, I was doing um, Signature, it was in France. And the, the, the Queenie book is about these, you know, mafia woman who basically ended up running the numbers game in Harlem. Right. And um, this true is story. Harlem, y'all, so everybody in Harlem should have a copy. <laughs> true story, true story. And actually, side note, with the, bo the book got options, so hopefully well, there's gonna be a TV show, so. But, that'd be amazing. But basically, there's a guy, so there's a line of people, you know, uh, uh, waiting to have their book sign up, and there's a guy who's, you know, waiting, he's reading the book as, uh, some other people get his uh, my book signed, and uh, he comes up to us. He's, that's his turn, and we're like, "Oh, so did you like the book?" He's like, "Oh yeah, I just I just read it now." I'm like, "All right." <laughs> I was wait. and then he says, uh, "That said, did you like it?" He's like, "You know, mafias are not really my my kind of stories." It was all right, and I'm like, "Why do you want your book signed right now?" But well, wait, he paid for the book. He did. Take the money. <laughs> he paid for the book and stood online. Francesca Ransby told me a story like that once. Like somebody bought three, two copies of her book, got all the way to the front, and was like, I can't stand you. I can't stand anything that you're about. And she's like, but you bought two copies of the book, though. Let me sign those. I was like, <laughs> why give win? me your money if you don't? <laughs> so, you know. Right? <laughs> One more question. I think this is our last question. Oh, um, <laughs> well, um, this will be brief, but um, I was just curious to know, um, are you guys into shonen or like shonen anime? Because um, um, there was recently announced like a, a black female protagonist like in a new anime called Clock Striker, but she's like, you know, yeah. one of the first female black female. Saturday AM, yeah. Yeah, it looks yeah, cool. Yeah, black manga. I mean, white manga, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that's going to have, like, a cultural impact, you know, because usually, like, shonen is, like, you know, a Japanese thing, but, you know, I notice we've taken, like, a lot of inspiration from other cultures. Um, well, I know shonen's very Japanese, but come on, like, at this point, uh, Dragon Ball Z is, like, super black. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 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 So yeah, I, um, I, I'm excited for it. Um, the art looks totally like really lovely. Um, I know I'm more like shoujo, but I just, I love um, seeing more Western artists just be like, yeah, I'm going to make manga because you know, like the influence is just back in and forth. So it's, it's great, I'm excited for it. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm, and I'm excited for most things that Saturday AM does. Um, and Noir Caesar, and th there's several uh, black manga houses now. And I think it's only going to be as exciting as we make it. Like, if it, you know, if, if people are reading it and they're yelling about it on places like TikTok and Twitter and things like that, 
um, I think it will have legs. But I don't get into those conversations. Like whenever anybody gets into the conversation, like, oh, anime can only be, you know, black, like the, or manga rather, can only be black. Like the word really means comic and anime literally means animation. So if you're referring to the style, okay, sure. But I, I honestly look forward to it and I think it's definitely needed. Um, and I also want to see more women manga artists, mangaka. So uh, black women specifically, because I know like, yes, you're doing a lot of work over here, but we need more. <laughs> Could we slip in one more question? Um, um, do we have time? One more. Okay. Yeah, you gotta ask. Hi, good afternoon. I wanted to say congratulations to the panel um, and how inspirational you have been to me and I'm sure everybody else here. I'm an actress and I was introduced to uh, characters because I knew how much they was making at the Comic Con. <laughs> and then a friend of mine turned me on to superheroes and like over the pandemic, I acquired like 692 comics, all black characters. Um, so go. I was really excited about Naomi and was a little disappointed. So I wanted to ask you Karama about, um, about Monica Rambo. Uh, so are they, really having um, black writers behind that? And what is the structure for her? I don't have all of the stats on the whole movie, but I do. there are some black writers in the writer's room. Good. Um, I, I, it, they're trying to show all of the characters together. So it's not gonna be like Monica's movie. I wish it was. But it, it's gonna be, as we saw in the TV show that she was in when she was on WandaVision, sorry y'all, deep cuts, um, she has a little beef with Carol Danvers and that we think it's around her mother. Um, so I'm hoping we get to see the, the actress who played her mother too show up. Um, so I'm hoping that she gets more, I mean, she's gotta have more screen time than she had on WandaVision and I really, really hope that they don't do any more crazy scenes with her like they did. Like one of the things that made me crazy was her putting her very real body on the line for mm -hmm. Wanda's very fake children. That made me absolutely bananas. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time she might not have known that, but you know. Um, so I'm hoping that all of this launches into her getting her own series, yeah. just like Miss Marvel had her own series. I That's was hoping definitely. that they would have more structure to her, only because in Black Panther it felt like they just dropped her in. You know? Oh, wait. Uh, Monica Rambeau? Monica Rambeau. Are you talking about, because which character? Monica Rambeau is like Photon. She's going to be in the yeah. movie Marvels. She has True. our own comic right now, which is really yeah. great. By True. Evening. Okay. Are, wait, are you referring to Ironheart? I think that's who I'm confusing her with. Okay, it's oh, okay. Sure. Ironheart was in Wakanda, uh, Wakanda Forever. It's right. It's a safe yeah. space. <laughs> um, Ironheart was in Wakanda Forever. I am very much looking forward to her show because she already has it. It's coming to Disney Plus. Yeah. And it's already laid out. Dominique Horn is doing that. Yes. I was in um, um, there are black Judas writers and in the Black room. Messiah with her. So yeah. Yes, there's definitely black writers in that room. Um, and I'm getting, I'm happy to see a different suit because I wasn't really happy with the suit that was in. Okay. <laughs> you didn't like the heart? One more quick question, if we could, just one more. We're, we're, I think we're out of time right now. Just, she's been waiting. Yeah, she's been okay. waiting. All right, super really quick, quick. Yeah. last question. Okay, it would be really quick. I just wanted to know, because I'm working on my own mangas, and I'm working on with my nieces, their own manga. They're working on their little story, they're 10. I want to know, how do you focus on not, because I have a lot of stories, how do you focus on just that particular one? and not get like, you know you have to like work on the other ones, but like work on the one and like just finish it and get it out. Do you watch anime? Yes. Okay, so you know how anime has arcs? Yes. So like they'll have like, like two episodes, not Dragon Ball. They have one fight for uh, six, six <laughs> seasons, not Dragon Ball. But, <laughs> but anything for Dragon Ball. But like other anime where they have like a story that ends in like three or four episodes, that's one arc. Okay. So think of it, even if you've got a whole season, think of it almost like anime, even if you've got a whole season's worth of stuff that you're trying to write, bring it down to one arc and that might make it easier for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you to the Schomburg, thank you to all the panelists up here. Thank Please you. introduce yourself because we didn't get to introduce right. you. <laughs> no, 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 no. 
I want everyone to support all these panelists. Um, they will be signing books in the gallery, so you all can buy a book and get it signed by everybody. So thank you again for coming. Thank you. Where, where can people listen to your podcast? Oh, we everywhere. are on Spotify, right, iTunes, Apple, everywhere. called Nerds, Herbs, and Words. It's a um, 420 literary podcast where we discuss comics, graphic novels, and books with authors while consuming cannabis. There we go. There we go. You had me at cannabis. Can we get one more round of applause okay. for this panel? This was incredible. Thank you all so much. Yes. Okay. We're going to ask everyone to leave as everyone is already getting up. But just letting you know, we have another panel that's going to be in an hour. Um, so starting at 3.30, it's Black in the Future, Afrofuturism, and Comics. So please come back for that. Thank you.